Guys, champions are champions. We are live right now, and Johan Creek is clutch. He almost couldn't get on, but I was just saying it was like he hit a backhand winner down the line, last second, <laughs> figures out, goes to his phone, gets on. That's champions are champions no matter what age they are. Johan, amazing to see you here. Oh, we can't hear him, though. <laughs> <laughs> His audio, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. We cannot hear you. Try, try and get your audio to work. I'll come back. I'm going to test you in a minute. Right. Um, guys, it's awesome to be on the call with you. Uh, we are going to be going over. Hopefully, we'll be talking to Johan. You can see he's there. He's trying to get on and... and uh, but we just can't hear him right now. But I'm sure we'll figure that out. Hopefully, we'll figure that out. But we're going to talk about one of his greatest victories he's had in his career, which was beating Guillermo Vilas at the French Open, which is the equivalent in those days of beating Rafa Nadal on clay. Like, it was a very similar thing to be able to do. But the only difference was back then, there was all kinds of different styles of play. And people were more considered, you know, grass court specials, hard court specials, clay court specialists. And it wasn't often that you could do a crossover and have a completely different style and win. So we're going to be talking about that and, and how you can maybe beat some people at your club that you want to beat up on, even if you have the odds against you. We're also going to be going over the French Open predictions, what to expect at the French Open. It's going to be a very interesting French Open this year. It's wide open for the first time in literally about 20 years, right? I mean, that's, that's how crazy... Rafa's domination has been, and now that he's not there, now it is actually wide open. It should be pretty interesting. And then the reason we're all on the call tonight, why I have Steve Contardi over here, who is the biggest living legend I know, and <laughs> he down below him over there, and then Johan Creek, is we're all going to Paris together, and we want to invite you. In fact, before we begin, I want to see if I can get myself in solo layout. And I just want to show you guys this video because this is one of the best weeks of my life that I've ever had. And then we're going to tell you guys throughout the, throughout the call tonight how you can join us in Paris. We're getting ready to go there in a couple months. You see I got the Rafa hat on. So check this out, guys. And then we're going to do a sound check with Johan. Uh, solo layout. Watch this. Watch this, guys. This is why we're on the call tonight. I want you guys to come here with me and everybody on the call. Oh my gosh, we so want you to come. We so want you to come. All right. Um, I don't see where Johan is, but anyway, let's let's get started. First of all, Steve Contardi, how are you feeling tonight? Steve Contardi is doing great. Always fun to be with you guys and to uh, to talk tennis, our favorite subject, of course. Good. Guy, how are, how are things over there in Europe? Where are you right now? I can't keep up with you. Yeah, everything is going well. I'm in, actually in Switzerland, uh, so I'm uh, six hours ahead of you guys. It's 2 a.m. here, but everything is going well. I just uh, slept a little bit, woke up, and uh, always a pleasure to wake up and play and, and, and talk with you, Peter. Yeah, absolutely. And, and on the call, we've got some legends. Scott and Sharon Levy, they have been to France, so they can vouch for that. They have just come back from Madrid uh, and and they're interested in going to south of France next year. So they, they're awesome. I want to welcome on the call. Uh, I'm hearing a lot of reverberation. What can I do to fix it? I, I don't know the answer for that. Uh, nice to see you guys. So there we go. And I see Johan back in the call. He's giving it again. Another big try. Johan, are you there? I see. Can you say hello? Can you hear me now? We oh got you. Gosh. Good job, yes. Johan. Oh my gosh. Sorry, yes. I have to go into the dark web and <laughs> sort some people out before you could hear me. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great. It's great to see you. Hey, Johan, do you know Tennis House? He seems to know everybody. Devor, you know Devor? 
Yeah, the the guy from uh, New Orleans. That's right. He's on yeah, the yeah. call. Yeah. Hey, yeah, Devore. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Devore. Yeah, we all know Devore. Good guy. So, Johan, before we get into your experience playing the French Open, I wanted to just get pick your brain on what do you make of this year's French Open? You know, Rafa not being there. It being more wide open, Novak having some injuries. What, what are your thoughts as, as they enter this tournament? Well, first of all, it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like a like a death in a family with Roger with uh, with uh, Nadal not there. So that really, uh, you know, when, once you get past that mourning period, because he was such an iconic guy, and everybody wanted to see if he could do it again and again and I mean to win it so many times in a row it's just absolutely absolutely astounding his record i don't think will ever be broken i think it's just there's too much uh, physicality now but uh, you know i do think that looking past that uh, negative issue of him not being able to play we know that at some point he was going to stop but it was kind of a shocker to see that he's not playing the french but that is what the body tells you you know so uh, we have to believe what he's telling us and he's a tough warrior he would not uh, back out of a tournament if he's not if, if, if he can play, he will play. But uh, he's always shown that he has uh, is the, the mind of a, of a serious champion. But besides that, I think there's a lot of newcomers on the, on the ground. I mean, obviously, Alcaraz has had an incredible impact on tennis since the US Open that he won last year. So I think he's a, he's a dark horse. But he's sort of starting to niggle with some injuries as well. Rune is on a big upswing. And then there's the crazy, weird swinging Medvedev, you know, who is... Uh, he works. He looks like somebody that works at Kilwins that you're a little bit afraid of, but he dishes up a really good scoop, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, so do you know what Kilwins is? It's a really nice ice cream place. Yeah. And uh, but anyway, so uh, um, but yeah, I think there's uh, there's there's going to be some uh, some new champions coming out. Hopefully, uh, you know, I mean, uh, Djokovic is out there, and he's obviously the guy to beat in many ways. But uh, he's got some nagging injuries as well. And, um, you know, the young bucks are right around the corner, ready to take over from these top three guys. I think Alcaraz is not going to get a go away. Arun is really on an upswing. And Medvedev is in there in the mix. And, uh, you know, Casper Root has dropped off a level or so, maybe a little bit. But uh, I think uh, it's going to be a very interesting uh, summer of tournaments, of Grand Slams. I'm really looking forward to watching the French because I've never mastered the language. So I want to listen to the umpire. Because when I played at the uh, Roland Garros, I would ask the guy, excuse me, what's the score? And he go, <laughs> you know, he said something in French and I'm like looking around, you know, and, and somebody would yell out at us, dumbass, it's 30 all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so man. my name was dumbass, 30 all. Okay. That's so good. Well, great analysis, first of all. And I agree with you on, on everything you said. Uh, guys, in the comments, as, as you're watching this, I would like to know, since it is so wide open, I'd like to know people who are watching tonight's live streams, your thoughts. Devor, write down who do you think is going to win the French Open? And I'm going to go around the horn, and then we'll get into tonight's lesson. So, Steve Cantardi, I, know, I think he kind of nailed everything as far as um, – you know, who's in the mix, but who do you think is going to win? Who is your pick and why? And we'll watch this video in a couple of weeks and see if any of us got it right. Well, uh, I guess you, know, you got to go with Alcaraz. Uh, of course, we saw him play in Madrid, and I think he got a little bit careless at times, but, uh, you know, he did what he had to do. And, uh, you know, he's got all the tools. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, he's going to be pretty fired up that Rafa's not there and that, uh, uh, you know, so many believe he's the heir apparent as it is. So uh, I would have to think that uh, that's his surface and, uh, you know, his uh, his speed and everything that he does is just tailor-made for that court, I believe. Hmm. Alcaraz, that's a solid pick. What about you, Guy? You're from France. We're going to Paris. We're going to be playing there. What do you think? I think Yohan is going to win this year, actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no, I actually think Gasper Wood is going to win this year. What? Yeah, I think uh, he's an underdog. He's not playing so well this year. He played so well in Rome, almost beat Rune. Nobody's waiting for him. Uh, he made the final last year. Don't forget about it. He has a lot of experience. Uh, I think Alcaraz is super favorite, maybe a bit pressure on him. He has been injured quite a lot this season, I think. Rooney, the same. 
uh, a bit injured. So I don't know if they how it's gonna be for them to you know to play three, four, five sets every matches. Uh, maybe they have a tough first round or second round. Um, Djokovic, I don't see him winning, but you never know. He's a great champion. I'm just I'm just gonna put a, a coin on on Rude. Okay. Yeah. And- and what about you, Johan? You you made you basically. I think you're right on. And who's in the mix? Who do you think? Who are you going to pick if you had to pick one? Um, if I have to pick one, you got to go with it. You got to go with Djokovic because obviously he's he's fresher than most of the guys. Even though he may have some sort of a nagging thing, but he's uh, again he's uh, he, he's he's so well managed with his uh, body and his intake of fuel and all of that stuff i mean he's an ultimate professional in that arena so mm-hmm. i would give uh, i would give a a, a a hat tip towards novak to win it this year and i think he will completely reset the whole grand slam slam you know the the, the grand slam numbers uh he's going to be the greatest greatest of all time there's no question in my mind um, I think he's still, you know, he's still got at least five years. So five times four, that's 20. I, you know, I can do math. Um, so I think he's still got about a, at least a half, a, 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 at least a dozen Grand Slams to 20 of, in, in his bag that he can play if he stays healthy. There's no way that he's not going to win any of them. He's mm. too good. He's too yes. good. And, uh, you know, I, I've i watched Rune play in uh, in Miami because it's in my backyard. So I went to watch him play. And he's a little bit of a Johan Creek, you know. I mean, he's a... <laughs> You know, he gets pissed off and then he kind of goes off and he goes into somebody's face. And, uh, you know, I kind of like that because I thought I was the only whack job. But, uh, you know, um, he's not always my favorite, but I kind of like guys that ruffle other guys' hair, you know. (laughs) So we'll see how it plays out. But he's a hell of an athlete. He's done very well. Well, He's been in three Masters 1000 finals now, the last last number of tournaments. So I think he's going to be... a serious contender for the French, but I have to pick uh, Novak only because of his incredible uh, professionalism. And you know, I mean, Medi has got to be the the outlier. Yeah. You know, yeah. The, the the dark horse is Rune. The outlier is Medvedev, and uh, the champion, in my opinion, that is probably going to get to the finals at the very least or so is uh, is Djokovic. Yeah. yeah, good stuff. Oh, great. We got beeping horns out there. Hopefully, they'll figure that Somebody out. Somebody is too. stealing your car. Where do you so, live? Do you live in a bad neighborhood? Car. Uh, <laughs> they've got two cars going. Anyway, um, so William Peck agrees with you. Djokovic, another one says, uh, Tennis House says Novak without Rafa. This is awesome. I really hope that this, this <laughs> stops soon. <laughs> Was hoping Roth would play at Rome. Daniel has to be right up there. And so looking forward to seeing you again, John Alexander at in Texas. Okay. Great. So we've got over 50. Let's get into tonight's lesson. And I'm going to ask you the first question. I'm going to put you in solo layout to Johan uh, so you can talk. And oh, thank goodness that stopped. Uh, Let's talk your car about, is now officially gone. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about your big win uh, against Vilas at the French Open. And if you could first just kind of paint a picture, because people forget, like, how much different was it from the surfaces and the styles when you guys would go from hard court to grass to clay? Today, it seems very homogenous that mm. even when I was at... at um, Madrid, I was like, man, it, it almost looks like they're playing hardcore tennis out there. You know, how much different was it and, and how much of a battle was it to play at a clay court specials? Well, I'll give you a little bit of a, of, a, of, a, of a backdrop of what happened. So I am not known to be a clay court player, um, even though I won the tournament. There's an exhibition tournament. I beat uh, Gomez, Arias, Crickstein. I beat uh, Courier on clay in Charlotte, North Carolina. So that was my claim to fame. I won that tournament five years in a row. So they put a little plaque on a on a tree there called Johan Creek, C-R-W-E-K, because there was like a two-inch stream that ran through the club. So that was my claim to fame on clay back in the day. And uh, so when I played the French, um, I was joking with people. They said, why are you going to the French? I said, because my wife at the time, uh, my first wife said that she wanted to go shopping. So I kind of made, I, I completely took the pressure off me to perform well. And uh, 
you know, I got there and I was I was really trained well. I mean, I, I worked really hard in the summer in Florida in May to get ready for the French. I've never really done that much hard training on clay. So I spent a lot of time on a, on a green clay in Florida and uh, played with uh, kind of dead balls. I, I punctured some of the balls so that they would be heavy because, you know, the weather in France and it could be bad sometimes. But uh, so I got there and I won my first round, I think, in four sets. And I thought, geez, you know, I've never won a round at the Grand Slam in French, at the French. And then uh, I played uh, a, a Czech guy that I had a massive serve. I forgot his name now for a second, but um, ended up beating him in five sets. So I'm like, wow, that's great. And I think in the third round, I was in a locker room. And uh, in my third round match, I had to play Yannick Noah, mm. the beloved Frenchman from the Cameroon. And a good friend of mine at the time. And uh, so uh, the uh, physio left the room and he was working with a laser on his ankle. And Yannick decides to take over and become his own physio. And in the process, completely gave himself third degree burns on his ankle with a laser. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's the truth. So I was smelling something burning. And I'm lying on a, and here I see his skin is smoking and while he's talking and he's just doing this pen thing and obviously he must have not had too much feeling in his ankle but uh, he gave himself third degree burns that he had to default against me so I had a default against Yannick and then I played uh, in the fourth round uh, I think I played this guy Luis Matar from Brazil and he was hauling me in. Uh, I was up 5-1 five, five, in the fifth set. And he's hauling me in. And we got to 5-4. And it gets a little hairy. And I'm getting a little upset. And uh, the guy keeps asking me for to show the mark where it landed if the umpire called it out. You know, So I was getting a bit annoyed. And so by the fifth ball that he did that, now it's 5-4. Deuce, add, deuce, add, deuce, add. And I just thought you know what i am so tired i'm going to try and get to this guy because he's just jerking my chain and so i walk up to the net and i i pointed my finger i said come over here and i had a <clears throat> a couple of words with him <laughs> and he was playing with a big old woody prince graphite woody you know type of thing i grabbed the racket out of his hand stuck my my fingers through it and i looked like i was going to explode on him and stick this racket up his throat <laughs> uh, down his throat and he like backed up and was like eyes the size of saucers. And I threw his racket at his feet and I said, now you play. He served two doubles and I won the match. <laughs> <laughs> the intimidator. So, wow. Create the intimidator. I said, thank God the match is over. So now I'm playing Vila. So I had a couple of tough matches under my belt. And the day that I walked on the center court against Vila, I was like, oh my God, I felt a bit like a lamb to the, going to the slaughterhouse. Because, you know, Vilas can get into that mode just like a Borg used to be and just doesn't miss a ball. So the night before, I said, you know what? I'm going to play con concentrated clay court type of tennis. But the slightest moment he hits a short ball, I'm going to rip it or chip it or whatever and come to the net. And, and, you know, if he lobs me, I'll try and jump. If he tries to pass me, I'll dive. I'll look like a rugby player, but I don't care. And I ended up. I lost the first set 3-6. I am in the second set tiebreaker. And I deliberately remember at 5-4 set point for him to go upset two sets to love. I had a diving passing shot. Uh, volley. I was at the net and he passed me and I dove for the volley and I popped it up and he could get to it. And uh, I got to the ball and I somehow flipped the lob and he missed it by an inch. Mm. And I won the second set 7-6, and then I won the third set 7-6, and I won the fourth set 7-6. Mm. But I was up 5-3 in the fourth, and he came back. And um, I didn't have match points when I was up 5-3, but it got into a hell of a tiebreaker. And all I did was I attacked him the whole time. So I beat him in three tiebreakers on clay. And honestly, I have to say that that, to me, was the most mental match I ever played in my life, except for the 80 semifinals against Borg, where I also lost in five. That was equally very painful. But that one I lost against Borg. But this one against Vilas, I won. And honestly, I came off the court and I thought I was going to die because I was so tired. 
because I've never ex I've never really tried so hard on a clay court to dive and volley and you know attack and overheads. You know, it was the it was the absolute maximum I pushed my body. And we didn't have the fancy equipment and drinks at the time like they have today to kind of bounce back from six hour matches and stuff like that. So I was in bed the whole day on Thursday, uh, on Friday. I played on Thursday. I played. I had to play Lendl in the semifinals. Now, when I played Vilas, it was really hot in Paris. It was way over 90 degrees. And by Saturday, the weather has changed. And they, for the first time in the history of the French Open, I think it was like 48 degrees. It was really cold. And I had to play with a full track suit. Bill Norris, the trainer, whom you may know, uh, had set up a hydroculator behind my chair with these hot packs in it. And I would, every time I sat down, I would just, they had to inject my wrist, my elbow, and my shoulder so that I could walk on the court to play Lendl because I refused to default. I thought I had to default. I said, there's no way I can play against the number one player in the world on clay when he had a three-set match the day before and I'm playing this monster and gave it my all and I was completely depleted. And so uh, they gave me some cortisone shots. I could move my arm. So I played against Lendl and it was like, really, it, was, it wasn't even a match. I mean... I could not move. I tried my very best, but I lost in straight sets. And then he played Pern Force in the finals and won the French. Mm. What a great story. Well, I tell you what, I was uh, I was so depleted from that tournament. So I literally, uh, I, I uh, pulled out of Queens. I pulled, it was the only time in 38 years I didn't play Wimbledon was that year, 86, because oh. of my effort at the French. Wow. People thought that, people thought against Lendl that I was tanking. I couldn't move. I mean, I massaged, I did everything. Bill Norris, you know, was the guru trainer. He lives in Boca, not far from me. He will tell you the story. I mean, I was just spent. I was done. And I literally took six weeks off. I didn't play Queens. I didn't play Wimbledon. And normally I would play, if I didn't play well at Wimbledon, I had, I had a, fresh, a fresh Wimbledon I lost before the quarters. I would go and play Newport with a wild card or something. I, I, I pulled out of all the tournaments and then I started to play Stowe again. So I took six weeks off before I went back to the U.S. Open. Wow. All right. So I've got so many questions after that. Uh, when when you win that match and then, you know, you can't play on your, you know, what I would consider probably one of your favorite surfaces, grass, right? I mean, you, yeah. you're very good at coming forward and all that stuff. Was there a, a part of you that goes, gosh, I mean, it wasn't even worth beating Vilas? Or was it just like, I climbed Mount Everest, I beat Vilas, hmm. it doesn't matter. Like, what, what did you think? after that um what i thought what i thought after that match was like i have never pushed myself this hard ever mentally i mean i threw up twice in the flower pots like a sampras did against correct remember that in the 92 us open or 93 us open um you know i i've never pushed myself this hard physically ever on a tennis court and honestly i was i was exhausted i mean i i literally crashed in the, in, the, in, the, in the locker room and I just lay on the table and I didn't let anybody touch me for an hour. And uh, I took a shower and then I sort of waddled out. And I oh. blisters on my feet. My hand was sore. My wrist was killing me because I was hitting these high topspins, you know, and I had more sort of a semi-Western or Carnell grip. So I overworked my wrist. So that was tendonitis galore right away because as soon as you cool down, you start feeling everything that hurts. So I didn't even realize my feet were bleeding, the blisters in my, in my shoes. But uh, I was really spent. And so I had to take six weeks off. I mean, there's no way I could have played the, the week after that. I was just, uh, was, I was a cripple. But, you know. Right, I, but was, uh, it, was it worth it for you? I mean, did you, did you look, yeah. were you still happy that you won that match? Or did you regret that you put no. yourself through all that and had to lose? The rest no, of the it's 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 kind of like one of those weird results that people say, you know, he isn't good on this. You know, he's not a clay court player. You know, he's easy. He's a he's an easy draw. You know, and I got to the semis, and I'm telling you what, if I was fit, I would have had a hell of a match with Lendl because I would have attacked him. And then, you know, you saw how Chang took him out a little bit later, not in that that tournament, but later on, in '89, I think. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it was for me. It was a, a it was a very satisfying result because I, I have never, ever pushed myself physically that hard on a tennis court. And I was one of the fittest guys. I was just naturally fit, but I also worked very hard at my fitness. Um, and uh, But that match, uh, I, 
I pulled all the energy I could have out of my body and mentally, you know, to play when you don't feel, you, you feel like you're going to die because you, you run so much on that clay court. And uh, it was nearly a five-hour match in, in four sets. So um, I probably would have died if I played for set, but uh, I'm glad <laughs> I didn't have to test myself. But uh, no, I mean, it was a great result for me because, you know, I was known as a French player, as a, as a, but it was funny, the Le Figaro, the, the newspaper, maybe, Guy, you can go look at the 1986 sport front page of Le Figaro. I want to see that because they mm. did this caricature of me and uh, they said, you know, the guy that should never have done well at the French and here's in the semifinals and it was, it was kind of funny. Yeah. But, uh, but it absolutely showed me that you can push your body, you can push yourself mentally way beyond what your body can, can stand. Wow, that's great stuff. Steve Katari, the legend, you must have some thoughts and some questions for uh, our legend down there. What, what do you have to ask? Well, you know, I, I think, you know, he hit on it. Uh, you know, you, you, you don't know how far you can go until you're pushed. Uh, and that's obviously what happened uh, to Johan. Uh, you know, he was pushed and he, and he dug down deep and, uh, and, he, and he, he was able to go and give more than he ever thought he could. Yeah, he certainly paid the price, but uh, again, <laughs> exactly. that's what competition is all about, and I think that's a that's a major lesson to be learned right there. That uh, you know, when you have the opportunity, you know, push yourself because uh, there's new heights and there's new experiences uh, and and new accomplishments in that. And and I, I think uh, you know, very few people have had that experience to uh, to go almost uh, out of body and just push yourself uh, over the edge. Uh, for the cause. And uh, that's what athletics and competition is all about. Mm. Guy, any questions for Johan or any thoughts? Yeah, I was, uh, I was wondering, so you beat uh, uh, Yannick Noah in the quarters or in the, in which round did you beat him? He was the winner in, in 1983, actually. Yeah, the, no, I beat him. I, I was supposed to play Yannick, but he, he he destroyed his ankle with a laser because the the, the, the the French physio left the room, and then he decided to go medium well on his ankle with a yeah. laser. And I was smelling and, and, stuff, yeah. I was smelling. And, uh, you played on the you played on Chatrier on the main stadium. Philippe Chatrier, the, yeah. You yeah. Uh, against uh, against Villas. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wow. In a very hard day, very hard day. It was absolutely. I mean, it was it was almost an out of body experience for me because, you know, when I was on the court and uh, I got lucky in that jump, but they missed the overhead because he couldn't believe I got the ball back. So uh, he jumped and he was sort of startled and he, he he could have if he had taken his time on the lob, he would have he would have gone up two sets to lob. I don't think I would have beaten him then, yeah. but uh, he missed the lob by an inch. He hit the overhead and. I was like, oh, my God, I'm so lucky. And then uh, I, I won the next points because I think he just was a little bit bothered that he missed an easy ball. But uh, I ended up winning the second set, and then it was a dogfight. And, I mean, three tiebreakers on clay, and you're attacking a guy that is going to lob you and topspin you and keep you back on the baseline. It takes it takes a lot of skill and a lot of effort to kind of counter that big, heavy topspin all the time, you know? Mm. And uh, so uh, it was fun. I mean, I played with Don A. Rackets and then, you know, it was uh, it was the the first graphite Donne. It had my name on it as a as a as a player in the frame because there was a it was an experimental racket, and I used that Donne racket uh, to play uh, against Villas. And I had my own clothing from Le Coq Sportif. So I, had, as as a, as an American quote South African tennis player, I had a lot of French uh, a lot of French sponsors. I mean, I had Peugeot, yeah. I had Le Coq Sportif, I had the Rossignol rackets. Yeah. Um, you know, I had a lot of European sponsors. I had, was sponsored by Lotto and uh, I was sponsored by uh, LS uh, earlier in the career in 82 to 84, something like that. And uh, then a lot of French companies came, uh, you know, from 84 to 86, I was playing with Lecoq Sportif. So I would spend a lot of time in Grenoble and so forth. But it was a lot of fun. I mean, I, I really enjoyed, I, I wish that I had... Uh, I had more guidance with my tennis when I was, but I never played on clay until I was 18 years old. Okay. Not one mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And wow. uh, so it, it really, uh, you know, it was really for me a, a very big mental test that match. And it showed me what I can do to my body. If I, if I want to do something, I can just about kill myself mentally. Yeah. 
Um, but uh, that that cost me a lot of money and a lot of uh, a lot of pain and aches. But uh, I came back and you know finished my career. And uh, unfortunately, uh, in '89, I developed some uh, some elbow problems, and that took me off. And I had surgery, and it took me four years to come back. But by then, my career was over, so I just started on a senior tour by 1993. Mm. That match against Vilas, I want to I want to stick with that. So you were saying that when you're playing the match. You're telling yourself, okay, I gotta be patient. Yeah. But every opportunity I get, I wanna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna attack. Now, as before you went into the match, and then maybe as the match developed, what did you feel were the holes in his game? I mean, was there a certain approach shot? Was there a certain spot you wanted to hit it to? Was it more going in the back? And was it more going in the forehand? Was it trying to go deeper, shorter? Was it just mixing up all over the place? What did you feel? that your opportunities were as far as for him to miss or to give you an easy volley? Very good question. Um, well, I knew obviously how he plays because I played him. I played, uh, I've obviously seen him play a lot, but I've never played against him on clay. I played against him on, on uh, actually, I never played him. Hold on a second. I have never played Vilas until that match. Pardon me. I, I'm thinking senior tour now. But when I played him for the first time in 86, um, that was the first time that uh, that I ever played Vilas, and so I knew how he played, and he was, you know, a heavy topspin, and he had some backhand slices too. But he had this very heavy topspin that hits the service lines, and when he hits an angle, you know, he pulls you way off the court. So if you don't hit a really good shot the next time, you you could be in trouble, and he goes either behind you or he hits a clean winner on the other side. And uh, you know, he was a very I mean, he was a very fit guy. He was a strong guy. They didn't call him the bull of the pompous for nothing. And uh, I just sort of said to myself, you know what? If I try to max it, you know, mimic his tennis, <coughs> I'll probably lose in five hours, but I'll be dead. But I lose in three sets. So I said, well, I'll play his style of tennis with a, a deep ball from my end, you know, I'll take his heavy ball and flatten it down. So I took a lot of his heavy spins on the rise, which you can imagine, <coughs> excuse me, requires a lot of, a lot of, a lot of concentration, really good footwork and tremendous strength in your wrist because you counter the, you counter the top spin constantly. Mm. So I kind of had to, I, I had a game plan, but I had to execute that game plan to go to the next plan with, which is if I can continue doing that, I can probably take the ball if I'm if I'm really confident and hit the ball harder down, sort of more of a flat down shot and try and go for corners or angles. And, you know, I was really quick and I could slide really well. I mean, I didn't grow up on clay, but um, by 1976, I was in Austria and I played from 76 to 78 on red clay a lot in Europe because that was my apprentice years. And then I came to the States in 78 and then that's the rest is history. But by 86, which is eight years later, you know, I could play on clay because I played on green clay in America. So it was a good training field as well. But I knew that I, I, I had to sort of uh, adjust my, my, my approach to what's happening with the score, what's happening with his style of play. Can I counter it? Am I successful with it? And then uh, and or do I go completely kamikaze? So I didn't want to go completely kamikaze because it never lasts long because people figure you out. Clay slows the ball down so the guys can do more things to you. So I couldn't go completely kamikaze on everything, you know. <coughs> but I had uh, I attacked him at the right times and really was sort of a he was a counter baseline uh, you know grinder and I just became this all around thinker, drop shotter, diving volleys, uh, overheads, really kind of an acrobatic type of tennis on clay. Uh, that is a, definitely a lot different than playing on grass or even hard courts going to the net. I mean, because you're always unsure footed on your clay. So to jump and stuff like that, you've got to get your footing and it's sometimes you slip. So I had, I had the lowest sore back, I've, the lower back soreness after that match that I've ever had in my life. And uh, it just, it just, that match killed my physical ability to, to really recover fast enough to play a good match against Len. Were his passing shots um, like loopy and spinny and, and hard to reach out of the way? Did he flatten it out when you came in? Like, what was, his, what was his passing shot kind of strategy? Did he go at your feet and then try and pass you? Or was he just trying to pass off the first shot? 
what, did you notice a pattern yeah. of how he passed at all? Um, he would always pretty much pass down the line on his forehand. And uh, then I would, then he would like, you know, I would lean there because I know he's done it already four times, but you know, maybe he passed me once. I got some volleys back on the three of them, but you know, it's hard to put a volley away on red clay on the first volley. I mean, it's just, it's hard because the ball sits up, it, you know, the clay stops the ball a little bit, but thank God that day it was a hot day. So the, 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 the air was thin, the ball was flying. So it was a little bit in my favor. But, uh, I'm, you know, what makes me a good volleyer is that I was not only very well balanced and quick, but I had good hands, but also I could read where the guy was going to pass me. So even though he was going to pass me down the line, I acted like I wasn't sure. So I kind of come down the middle. But at the last second before he hits the ball, I would go with I would go down the line. And so I really I really kind of drove him nuts because he couldn't figure out why can't he pass me, you know. And so uh, that's how I played all my career, basically, it was a. A little kamikaze, but it looks kamikaze from the sideline. But I knew it was what I was doing. But mm -hmm. I knew that if I stayed back, it would just be I would just like melt into the ground. I mean, it would be a silly strategy, first of all, because I couldn't match his uh, his his capabilities of taking the net out with the high loops. So you know, I play four six inches over the net. He would play four or five feet, and um, like Bork sort of did. And uh, and I ended up um, just taking the risks and. It paid off that day, you know. I mean, I saw, you know, I saw a video of of my match. I don't know, uh, it might be on YouTube. You know, I don't, I don't search YouTube for my own uh, pleasure because some of those matches I'm I'm less proud of. But um, <laughs> I, I go out there and I watch some of these things, and I'm like, oh my god, that was crazy. I mean, the stuff that I did and the movement and stuff. But you know, that's how we played back in the day. You know, that was shortly two years shortly after gra graphite rackets came onto the market. Mm, good stuff. We got a question from another uh, one of our great followers, Gordon Tanner, over there in Oxford. And and what are your thoughts on his Vilas's loss to Nastasi with the spaghetti string uh, that wasn't legal? What what was the story on the spaghetti string? And and uh, he was on beating the run of fifty three matches in a row. Uh, and Gordon's asking, should should that loss be kind of looked at again and, and taken off the, the, the record books uh, or, or should it count? Or what, what was the deal with that whole spaghetti string? And what's your thoughts on it? You know, I'm the kind of character I don't it's almost like I am the kind of character like I would like walk by a Rolls Royce and see a dent. And I go, who the hell would do a dent to a Rolls Royce? That's the, how I look at this anomaly of this spaghetti rack. It's like. That was so off bizarre, you know, a bizarre time in tennis, but I'm not going to take it away and say, oh, it shouldn't count. You know, there's always these anomalies in tennis and sports and stuff like that. You know, it's like, uh, I don't know, a hole in one and a master. So how Tiger does some of these things that are impossible. And, you know, when he was really at the top of his game, let me, let, let me tell you, nobody knows except I do probably. And maybe some other guys. I was in Aix-en-Provence that week. Hmm. So I'm there with my little, um, I was there with my, um, what kind of rackets were I using back then in 70? Oh, I was playing with uh, head rackets with the, with the head, the red head, you know, the metal one. Yeah. And uh, they used to call it the red head. The throat was like a little red plastic thing with the aluminum. So I had four of those rackets and I'm seeing these guys playing with this bizarrely strong rackets. And one of them was Vila, it was, uh, was uh, Nastasi. And uh, I'm like, Nastasi was playing with the Adidas rackets, those beautiful wooden rackets, right? And I find out, who the hell is stringing these rackets? And they go, oh, this Australian guy, his name is Barry Phillips Moore. So, you know, I take two rackets out of my four rackets and I said, Barry, can you string these? He goes, you know, this takes a long time to string. I said, well, well how long? He says, it takes me at least a couple of hours per racket. So I, I, I saw what he does. I mean, he, he strings some of the string a little thicker gut, and then he puts glue on these little beads, and he slides them down the string, and he glues them in place. I mean, it's like a, it's like a, a, a cross between a, a, um, a tennis racket and a, a rake and a big sieve, you know? <laughs> it's like most bizarre thing. <laughs> so the guys are hitting with these rackets, and they play with their normal rackets, and they take these rackets out, and they start giggling because the ball is just egg-shaped every time they hit it. 
And then Vilas picked it up. And uh, I mean, Nastasi and he, you know, Mr. Mr. Um, Darth Vader with his incredible hand-eye coordination and talent. And he just tooled with that racket. And then he played Vilas. And unfortunately, I wasn't there for the final match, but I was there that week playing the qualifying. And I stayed for a few days into the tournament because I had nowhere else to go. And uh, I had these two spaghetti strung rackets in my bag and I should have kept them because the next week I had to play a tournament and I cut those uh, spaghetti strings out and I restrung my rackets normally. I was too afraid because I didn't know. It was such a bizarre uh, time to see that racket, what it does to a ball. I mean, <laughs> it's unbelievable. You could take a heavy topspin shot on it and hit an angle cross court into the service box and it's like it's shot out of a cannon. You can't wow. get, you cannot get to the ball. I mean, the egg, the ball was egg shaped, and um, so yeah, when that came through, where uh, where uh, you know uh, Nastasi beats Villas in that unbroken record that he had, fifty six matches in a row, and then obviously then uh, uh, it came to the U.S. Open, and then Michael Fishback from from uh, Great Neck, New York played when he's a bearded guy he's diving with the dolphins and the whales and he's like this hippie kind of guy and he goes and he beats stan smith with a spaghetti racket and everybody's taking notice suddenly you know and that's when they banned it <clears throat> wow that's crazy tennis Haas is uh inviting us to tennis house invite us to one of his conferences which we certainly will talk to you devore about we'd, we'd love to to see if you can, we can make it happen okay so let's bring everybody back that was awesome uh, stories from Johan again tonight. I really appreciate Good history. It. Good history there. Amazing. That's sure. A lot, of, lot make, of interesting stuff. <laughs> we want to make history in July like we did last year. One of my best weeks of my life last year going to France. And that's why we're on the call tonight is that in July, there's still time. There's still room to get in. And we're going to have some special uh, incentives if, if we're looking for how many, how many spots do we have tonight, Guy, with the special incentive we have? Uh, how many do we have, Steve? We have uh, four. We have four, four spots. spots. Four spots. And wait till a hell of a doubles get. team. Okay. We got to yeah. get yeah. the doubles team going. Yeah. Four spots to come to, to Paris. And, and I want uh, Steve and Guy to kind of talk together. Uh, explain what the trip is, how it came to be. We don't really need to go too much into how it came to be because people have been on the call before, but just what that experience is. And then I will certainly tell you my thoughts on it. I, I, I loved it last year, but uh, explain to everybody what they can do. All right. Of course, the, the idea stemmed from uh, the uh, fascination that so many of us have, as, as purists, as tennis purists have with red clay. And of course, we see so very little of it in the United States. So uh, the whole idea is to uh, not only play on red clay, but play on the most famous red clay courts in the world. And Guy uh, so skillfully uh, and diplomatically arranged for us to play at Roland Garros. So uh, that is the anchor uh, of the trip. Well, we will play two particular days at Roland Garros, but we've got all kinds of uh, other goodies thrown in as well. And of course, uh, Johan will be our legend host for that. Uh, uh, and then from uh, from uh, Paris, we go uh, on the fast train down to Lyon, and we play on more red clay down to Lyon, and we have a, uh, a number of other uh, off-court activities that are that are pretty special and things that you, know, you can't do on your own, and Guy can tell us a little bit about those. But uh, anyhow, the idea stemmed from uh, wouldn't it be great to play on red clay to, well, if we're going to do this, let's do what uh, not very many people can do. Let's play on Roland Garros red clay. And uh, that's really the anchor for the entire trip. And it's, uh, it's pretty cool. I have to say it's uh, to walk in there and, uh, and just, uh, just see that fabulous facility and to be able to play on those courts is, uh, it's pretty special. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Guy. Yes. You're the man who put so many of these amazing bells and whistles on the trip. Kind of let people know, I mean, on the court with tennis is going to be amazing, but kind of let people know the, the, the experience they're going to have off the court as well and, and how you make this, the, all this happen off the court. What are they going to be doing off the court as well? 
Yes, so obviously, as Steve was describing, we're going to have a lot of tennis and uh, we're going to play two days, two mornings on the on the red clay courts of, uh, of Roland Garros with Johan and you, Peter. And uh, a part of that, we we also stay in, uh, in a five-star hotel four nights in Paris, which is quite funny because the the, the five-star hotel is right across the street from Roland Garros. So basically, you, you wake up in the morning with a view over the, the stadium you have breakfast and uh, we have somebody open the door for you to play tennis there. <laughs> so it's quite special. Uh, and then, yeah, we have, uh, we have some from lunches in, in Paris at the, at, uh, at the tennis club. And uh, we have a very special uh, event organized on the 14th of July, which is the Bastille Day. We, we rent a private boat for a group and we will uh, tour the, the Seine uh, River with the different monuments of Paris. And then we're going to park in front of the Apple Tower and enjoy um, a cocktail dinner with the fireworks, which is, uh, which is quite amazing. Oh, wow. And a part of that as well, we will have a private tour of the venue of uh, the French Open of Roland Garros. And we will have lunch in the Chatrier in the, in the pre presidential lunch, uh, lounge. And after we'll go up to Lyon for uh, three nights. Um, we'll stay in a beautiful five-star hotel, uh, amazing location uh, right in front of the river. Lyon has two two main rivers, and we stay right in front of one. We'll have um, we'll have amazing dinners over there, a wine tour, playing one of the oldest uh, tennis club in Lyon, and uh, be with uh, with uh, with Johan, with Steve, with with you, Peter. So. A lot of stuff going on for seven nights, uh, eight days in France, and you're going to experience uh, France in a different way with tennis. <laughs> I, lo I love the way he explains it in that, that French accent. I mean, um... how could you not love to go? I mean, I want to go twice <laughs> now. Uh, no, but I, I, I forgot to tell you guys, you know, now that you mentioned Lyon, I knew we were going to Lyon, but. None of you guys know. I played in Lyon as my first time comeback. I was ranked 1300 in the world. I was four years off the tour, 1991. I'm trying to play. And one of the tournaments I played was in Brest, which is in, in, in near the... In Brittany. Uh, Brittany. In Brittany, yeah. And then I played indoors in Lyon. But it was... Yeah, uh, in, winter, October. Winter, winter, in October. Yeah, in October. So it was yeah. quite cold. And so... Yeah. I won a couple of rounds. I got to the quarterfinals. I qual I qualified and I got to the quarterfinals and I played Delaterre, the French guy. Ah, okay. And he beat me 7-6, seven, 7-6, six, seven, six, I think. Um, yeah. A young guy, you know, and I was trying to make a comeback. I was I was surgery, you know, I was fit. I was working in a gym and I came back. I won a couple of rounds. If I had beaten Delaterre, I would have played Sampras for the first time. Oh, man. And so I lost to Delaterre, but the funniest thing, and I'll tell the story. You guys know the story now. But uh, so it's seven six, and it's match point for Delata. I mean, he was a bull. This guy was so strong. You know, he's just he had a one handed back, and and he hit it twice as hard as I did, and I had a one handed back. But this guy was just a a French bullfrog, and so really strong guy. And so he gets match point, and it's indoors, and he tosses the ball up, and he hits it, and as he hits it, all the lights go off, pitch dark, <laughs> match no. point. You couldn't ask for better timing. <laughs> so now all the lights went off. We don't know where the serve was in. It didn't hit the net. It went over the net. And nobody knows if it's in or out. So <laughs> so the lights are like, you know, dim. And it's, you know, you can see where you walk, but you can't play. So two and a half yeah. hours later, we warm up for five minutes. He's got to serve at match point again. He served a clean ace down the middle. <laughs> oh, wow. wow. Oh, it was the funniest, the funniest yeah. ending of my career in a sense. So Lyon was kind of my last tournament, really. So it's kind yeah. of apropos, you know. Thanks, Steve, for giving me nightmares. Now I'm gonna wait till July 13 or you know whenever July 11th when we go to uh, France, and I gotta go to Roland Garros for the first time since 1987. Right, yeah, well, I was we'll, gonna you'll get some revenge. You'll get some revenge down in Leon, and we'll keep the lights <laughs> on. All right. Yeah. Please, no load shedding like South Africa. We'll just go there and have a nice one. But I tell you what, I'm a I'm a foodie now. You know, I'm a foodie, and uh, I tell you what, French cooking. If you leave me there for six years, I would love to stay there and do my French cooking and all that stuff. I, I if I wasn't a tennis player, I would be a chef. I mean, I just love cooking. I love the culinary world and the wines and the. It's really, really a spectacular uh, arena, 
and uh, I can't wait to sample my French beans, my sole manure, and uh, all of the wonderful French dishes that are there. I can't wait to gain 20 pounds and then never get it again. <laughs> <laughs> So guys, I, I want to I want to share this with with you you uh, everybody on the call. Um, the the night that uh, Guy was talking about Bastille, it, it was literally one of the best nights of my life. I remember saying to Yvonne, my better half, I'm like, this might be the best night of my life. And when I was in Madrid, there's another uh, guy who came, Dave, who went last year to France, and then he came to Madrid. He loved both trips, but he was saying that he was telling his wife that night we were talking about the night when the fireworks are coming out of the Eiffel Tower. And he said to his wife, I think this might be the best night of my life. So I want to show you just what it looked like on my phone. I mean, there, <laughs> being there, you can't explain it. I mean, trying to show on my phone is just like, it's not even the same thing, but I just want to see if, if I can show this for you guys just so you can see it. Uh, hopefully it will turn out okay, but I know it's not going to do it justice, but if you can see that, that was coming out of the Eiffel Tower. I'll play the video. But, I mean, it was one of the most spectacular things I've ever been a part of in my life. And we're on our own private boat as this wow. is happening. Wow, that's amazing. It was just unbelievable. And, and so I, I like to say that these trips are like drink. If you love tennis and you want to travel, these trips are like drinking fun out of a fire hose, out of a fire hose. Like, it's just like, the fun is just like coming at you so fast and so fierce. And every time you think you've had too much fun, you wake up the next day and you have more fun. And, and I'm not even exaggerating. That's exactly how the trip is. Once you think you've had too much fun, you wake up the next day, you have more fun. So I put the uh, link uh, up there in the comments section. It's right above DeBoer's uh, comments. So you can click and you can see that. You can you can sign up if you want tonight. We have four spots and we have a bunch of bonuses. And Guy, I want you to go through the bonuses because we've got a really cool bonus with the man right next to you. Johan Creek is going to do something really cool. And so this is just for the four people that if you sign up tonight or till tomorrow morning, and you just, you don't have to commit the entire uh, fee. I, well, Steve will go into how much you have to put down if you're interested. But tell them all the bonuses on top of everything that they're already going to be getting. Yeah, uh, so um, from the bonuses, one of the bonus is uh, you and uh, you uh, better half will be invited on top of the Eiffel Tower uh, with a cup of champagne. Uh, the other, uh, the other giveaway is, uh, I think it's a gift card, uh, Steve, uh, $400, 150 to the tennis points. That's point, um, and four of you guys will have the chance to, uh, share the court with, uh, Yohan Creek for, uh, for one hour, uh, in, uh, I'm going to kill him. Uh, I'm going to kill him side to side, slide <laughs> up and down. <laughs> Kill it. Take them to that experience that you they, had on that red They clay. will feel how I felt at four hours, 58 and a half minutes. <laughs> and uh, and I think that's pretty much it. Uh, the Eiffel Tower, uh, the, 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 the gift card, and the, the lesson with, uh, with your one. Absolutely. Okay. So, so this is a great trip. So if you're thinking of coming anyway, I mean, look at that. You get to go right up. There's the Eiffel Tower. It's just amazing. Again, you can see it pictures of it but nothing uh, when you're right there it is just stunning so one of the bonuses is you get to go right to the top of that and then Guy is going to have a special champagne there for you uh to enjoy with your with your better half uh you're going to be able to get a private lesson with johan creek that's pretty awesome the man who took down v loss the man who's won two grand slam titles i mean just awesome stuff <laughs> And then the other bonus is you're going to get a gift certificate to Tennis Point so you can maybe go buy yourself, uh, you know, some new clothes or whatever to, to go and sport out there uh, in France. So I'm, I'm got the, I have the link there. I'll also email it out again. I'm going to put the link right here in the comments section. But when we get off tonight, I'll, I'll email everybody the replay and I'll put the link 
And Steve, so to sign up, what is required to sign up and get your spot for this once in a lifetime trip? Uh, we need a $1,000 deposit. Uh, the balance will be due. Uh, we're coming up on it. So balance will probably be due uh, 45 days before the trip. So but a thousand thousand dollars will hold a spot for now. And the trip and, is from the 11th to the 18th of uh, July. Mm -hmm. Right. July 11th through the That's 18th. It. Correct. And, and D, what if I bring my spouse, but my spouse does not play tennis? Are they going to be in the hotel room bored all day or do you have stuff that they will be doing as well? They can pass so, uh, jump off the Eiffel Tower. They'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so the yeah the, the 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 many of many of our players last year they we we brought a group of 30 34 players I think last year, and we had uh, ten spouses, eight ten spouses. So we had like a group of 42, and they had a lot of fun because the you know it kind of gets like in in the in the in the mood that everybody is hanging out uh, with each other and they. They, they usually build up their own plans because, you know, in Paris, there is just so much to do, so much museum to see. Uh, many people haven't seen the city before. And uh, and we like to give them a lot of free time um, when, the, when the others are playing tennis. They're obviously invited to all our lunches and dinners. Uh, they will come on the dinner cruise as well. But uh, we I wanted to, to leave the people um, doing their own thing in Paris. And obviously in Lyon, when we are there three days, um, they will be less free time. Uh, they are going to go on the private tour uh, of the city. We're going to go on the wine tour uh, on different restaurants and, and places to go. So that's pretty much what it is for, for them. So they have a, a package price as well for them, a much lower price than the others. And uh, yeah, they, are, they will have some fun. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a key to our trips. Uh, obviously, the tennis players have plenty to do. Uh, Guy has made such wonderful arrangements uh, for the non-players, and uh, uh, there's plenty of activities for them to do, and they're certainly a part of the of everything that goes on. So, uh, yeah. um, again, we 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 polled the non-players last year, uh, and of course, also with the trip we just con uh, just completed in uh, in, in Spain, and uh, the non-players had every bit as much fun uh, as as the tennis players. So that's. Uh, that's again one of the things that I think is pretty special about these trips. Yeah, we have Frank Long who says Paris would be great. Haven't been there since I was ten years old. Frank, you should do it. Uh, it was amazing when when I was invited to come on this. I was excited to go to Paris. I, I but I didn't know what I was getting myself into. You know, I, I just out of being naive. You know, I thought, oh, it's gonna be fun. Get to go to Paris. But the city blew me away because as an American, the way that it is built, the history of it, and every single thing that they build is a work of art. If you walk by a bridge, it's a piece of art. It, I mean, it doesn't matter. Statues, monuments all over yeah. the place, walking down the Seine River and looking at everything, it's it is stunning. It's breathtaking. If it's been a long time since you've been there or you've never been there, you should definitely go. <laughs> you should definitely go. And if, if tennis is something that you love to do and travel, it's just not going to get better. I, I mean, it's first class yeah. all the way. Yeah. And something to mention, Peter, too, is, you know, who was surprising as well or not. I am actually from Lyon. I was born there in Lyon where you won plays one of his last tournaments. And uh, that's the second part of the trip where we're going next. We're going to take a fast train from, uh, if they are not on strike, I'm kidding. Uh, we can take a <laughs> fast train from Paris <laughs> to uh, Lyon. <laughs> and uh, and uh, people were, um, I was very uh, happy to, to see that all the people coming on the trip uh, lacked Lyon as much as they liked Paris because they, they really had fun over there. You know, the hotel yeah. was, was really great. And city was it's a really nice city you eat so well it's i mean it's beautiful as well uh, with the architecture the the the, the culture uh, sites and uh, and the white hall we're doing uh 40 minutes away from from the from the town so it's uh yeah it's a complete uh, it's a complete package where you will experience france as uh, at his best as a tennis player and me as a french play i'm a french uh, i'm a french guy you know i never 
I never got access and a chance to play in the in the venue of of, of Roland Garros. It's, it was quite special when I got there and I got uh, got with this group in the venue. I was you know goosebumps at the other people. And when I got on this private boat to to watch the fireworks, I had like oh my God, I cannot believe it because not even a French is is doing these things. You know, it's yeah. uh, you know cannot imagine. So yeah. Guys, if you, have, if, if you have any questions about the trip, leave them in the chat. Uh, and then he was talking about Leon there in the hotel. That's a picture of me. That's the hotel right behind me. And I would say this is probably the nicest hotel I've ever been in in my life. Uh, I believe they have the number one bar in Europe, right? Is that right? Number one well, hotel no, they, bar in they, Europe. That's correct. No, wow. they, they they were elected the best hotel in France in uh, two years ago, and uh, they have the best hotel bar in the world. Wow! Yeah, yeah. we're yeah, gonna yeah. see that where, one. We're gonna. We're gonna I know where I'm gonna hang out with you, Guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, guys, this is I, I in the back. I don't know if you can see it, but um, this is my Michael. French Le Coq Sportif. Let me see. There, Le Coq Sportif, my French. Nice. This is the shirt that I played against Vilas with. I don't think right. I oh. it anymore. Can you believe it? This wow. is it. still sweaty. Are, are you gonna Are you gonna wear it? <laughs> it smells. Uh, it's the smell of fear. Um, <laughs> no, but I. You know what I'll do, Steve? I'll bring my. I have maybe one or two of my Johan Creek Rosignol French rackets left in my in my uh, in my uh, office here. And I will bring one of those to to give out as a raffle, you know, at the end of the Leon trip. How about right. that? Oh, oh my God. Thank you. You're a surprise. Okay. Yeah, that's wow. uh, they don't exist anymore. They don't. But I have a couple of brand new ones that are hanging around in my office here somewhere, and uh, I will uh, I will I'll give one away to a lucky uh, trip uh, attendant. So uh, nice. we'll, we'll 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 do something fun at dinner or something. I, I'll we'll talk about it. I, I think we have uh, wet Frank Long's whistle here. He is he is uh, looking excited. So hopefully, Frank, you will come. Uh, any any anything else that we want to say before we sign mm -hmm. off tonight? We've had Johan on for an hour. We really appreciate his time tonight. A great lesson. The lesson of the night, I think, is just push yourself to the limit, and you'll surprise yourself. Uh, yeah, that's how you achieve some greatness. But uh, Anything before we sign off tonight? Yeah, yeah. Maybe I just wanted to add something, Peter. It's um, it's the second year we're doing this trip. Uh, I think Steve can can say something about that because he has been trying to bring a group to play at the venue of the French Open for almost thirty years, Steve. Right, right. Over, over thirty years, and uh, last year it finally happened for you. So it was a dream it came true. Um, this year it's gonna happen. Next year we will not go to Paris and uh, and and Lyon because, um, uh, as you know, probably the Lyon uh, Paris is receiving the Olympic Games, so they will be playing tennis and there will be some boxing in in the in the venue of Roland Garros, and we do not know when we will do that trip again actually because um, the, the 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 federation is. Uh, it could be sometimes a complicated uh, institution, even more in France, and um, and we don't know if the president uh, is going to change or he's going to change a little bit the you know the rules. If he's going to allow people from uh, from outside to co-play in the venue, you know, because Roland Garros is not like a normal club where you you open the door and you go play. Huh? You really have to. Uh, we really pushed to get this group coming to the venue. And we don't know when will be the next time we will be able to do it. Good, good point. And uh, you, know, uh, you know, one one thing we we learned over the uh, over the course of the last couple of catastrophic years is that life is pretty short. So uh, you know, let's uh, you know, we like tennis, uh, we like to travel, we like people, and we like unique things. And there's very little that's uh, uh, more unique than uh, than playing at the at, at Roland Garros. So. Uh, you know this uh, the tennis lovers. Uh, this is this is a fabulous trip, and uh, we would be honored to have you travel with us. Uh, we can assure you a, a darn good time. A very good time. You know, seize the day is the way. You know, because 
Yeah, you're right. We don't know when we'll be back. We know we're definitely not going back next year. You don't know if you're going to be able to do it again. I mean, to, to be able to organize a trip where you can go do all these things and actually play on the Roland Garros courts, that's, that's quite a feat. Uh, so I've also put in my email address, crunchtimecoaching at gmail.com. If you have questions, you can email me as well. So if you're like thinking about this, but you're like, I have questions and I don't really want to put them in the chat. You can email me. We can even get on the phone if you have any questions. I'm sure Steve or Guy uh, would also be happy to answer any questions if you have questions that I can't answer. But as someone who went last year, I should be able to answer pretty much any question you have. And I can more than vouch for the trip. I cannot wait to go back. I mean, basically, like, I'm going to every darn trip that, that these guys do. Like, I'm not missing out because <laughs> it's like they're the time of a life lifetime for me so i i just love it johan i can't wait to be hanging out with you in france you're, uh, you're gonna love this trip and uh, that's it absolutely guys. yeah yeah i'm really looking forward to it i don't think i'm gonna keep my wife away she's gonna come with me so uh, we're gonna probably drop off the two little squirts somewhere at an academy and let them duke it out there with the europeans on red clay and see how hard it is what dad went through yeah, and then like come back home and yeah. see the scuffed knees and the dirt and the, the pockets and stuff it'd be a lot of fun so it's gonna be a, it's gonna be i'm looking i'm really looking forward to it because uh, i have a lot of fun with people that are like-minded and have a have a sense of humor and have fun with the trip and the tennis is fun and you know the food is just outrageously good in France, and in the the it's just really, it's the it's the culinary um, uh, paradise for for any chefs and any people that love wine and champagne and the food. And it, I mean, now the guy is it Mr. Long is uh, talking about the escargot. I think I'm gonna start <laughs> putting my order in already. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, so we got four spots with the with the special uh, special stack package that we get. You get the uh, 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 semi-private with uh, with Johan. Okay, you get to go to the Eiffel Tower, and you get a hundred bucks at the, at Tennis Point, uh, and you get everything else that we've just talked about. So uh, come on, join us. Uh, we promise you a great experience. Guy, and, looks like you want to say something. Yes, I just I think something important we forgot to mention is that we are able to welcome our last people until uh, June fourth. Yes. June fourth, because and, and, because and, uh, simply because the, the the hotel is packed and uh, we have the rooms uh, booked for us until this date, then we will not be able to offer that that special rate for 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 a group. You know what I mean? Okay. Okay. So you guys hear that? It's a thousand dollar deposit, which gets you in. Um, and we're running against time. We're running against spots. We're not going to be going back next year. You get a lot of bonuses. So if you want to travel and you want to play tennis you're not going to be doing anything cooler than this uh i'm going to say good good night to all you guys and then what i'm going to do is i'm going to pull up my my screen one more time play the video for people who missed the video that gives a little synopsis of what it was like there but again there's nothing like being there but i'm going to play the video for you guys and then i'm going to end the stream so Good night, guys. I'm going to play the video for them so they can see one Thank more you, time. Thank you, Johan. Thanks, guys. Hopefully Hopefully we'll see you guys Good job. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Yes. Yes. No worries. I'm going back to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Guy. Take care, Thank you. Bye-bye. All Thank right, you, guys. So, so here it is. If you want to go, I'll just play the video one more time. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. I got to put the sound on. Good night, everybody. See you in the Good night.